Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Sherry. I wanted to talk to you guys today about a case, and I hope you guys are strapped in and ready for some serious drama. Casey Kasem was a beloved American icon until his death in 2014. He was the host of the national radio program, American Top 40, from 1970 until the early 2000s. He was also the host of several other countdown shows on the radio. Another thing he is widely known for is that he was the voice of Shaggy from the Scooby-Doo cartoon shows and movies. He voiced Shaggy from 1969 until 1997. Chances are, if you walk in and a Scooby-Doo show is on TV, you're watching one that Casey Kasem played Shaggy, a very talented guy. He had the perfect radio voice, but he was able to alter his voice to sound differently for the Shaggy character. That's pretty difficult to do. Seth MacFarlane, who is the creator of Family Guy and a few others, are really good at this. It's definitely something that takes a lot of vocal training, which Casey had. Casey was well-loved by everyone. People couldn't wait to tune in to the American Top 40 radio show once a week to hear the countdown of all the popular songs for that week. I remember hearing it in the car with my dad on the way home from church on Sundays when I was a kid. Casey Kasem died in 2014, and the mysterious events happening around his death make people scratch their heads. There's been a lot of media attention on this case, and it's truly bizarre. What happened to our beloved American icon? Let's discuss today. This is the case of Casey Kasem. Casey Kasem was born in Detroit, Michigan on April 27, 1932, to his parents who were immigrants from Lebanon. His parents wouldn't allow their children to speak Arabic. They wanted to raise these kids as full-blooded American kids. Whatever they did surely worked because Casey Kasem is as American as they come, and he's definitely a part of American history. Casey started out covering his high school sports teams on the school radio, and then he went off to college where he worked as a narrator for children's programs. In 1952, Casey was drafted into the U.S. Army where he worked as a radio host on the Armed Forces Network. So this guy has had a passion for radio since he was literally a teenager. He's putting his talents as a narrator to work, something I wish I would have done, you know, a long time ago. (laughs) Casey comes back home from war, and he's back in his state of Michigan. He works in Detroit as a DJ at a local radio station. He's found by Dick Clark. You guys all know who Dick Clark is. And Dick Clark makes him a co-host on one of his music shows. So he ends up blowing up. Casey also had some small acting roles, but he was mainly known for his voice. His voice was the key to his career. So in the late 60s, he gets offered the the part of a voice for a character on a new cartoon show called Scooby-Doo. He would be voicing the part of Shaggy, who was Scooby's owner. He would go on to voice Shaggy for the next 28 years. Thousands of Scooby-Doo shows and movies were recorded with Casey's voice. He's also used his voice for a number of characters on Sesame Street. So one year after he starts voicing Shaggy, this is 1970 now, Casey and a few other DJs start the American Top 40 national radio show. So this would air once a week across the nation, and it would count down the top hits from that week, starting at number 40 all the way down to number one on the charts. Casey would introduce the songs and say a little passage about each one. Sometimes he would give trivia facts about the singer or a short biography. Back then, there wasn't instant access to songs unless you own the record, so you would wait to hear it on the radio. So his Top 40 show was in everyone's cars and living rooms a lot. Casey would go on to host this radio show for many years. He ended every show with the same line, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. So in 1988, Casey was hired to do a few voices on the cartoon Transformers. He did it for two years, and then he's given a script for the show one day, and he noticed there was a character named Abdul, who was supposed to be this evil villain. So Casey asked the director if there were any other Arab characters that were depicted as good guys. 
There was only one other Arab character, and he was a bad guy. So Casey said he couldn't in good conscience continue to work on Transformers. He felt it was offensive to Middle Eastern folks. Remember, Casey's parents were immigrants from Lebanon. So in the mid-2000s, Casey announced that he would be retiring from America's Top 40. The host that would take over would be Ryan Seacrest. Casey was brought back on a couple times, but he wasn't their formal, formal host. Remember, he's in his 70s by this point. His final voiceover work would be in 2009, when for the last time, he would play the voice of Shaggy in Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword. This was five years before his death. Now that I've gone through his career, let's talk about his personal life. We're going to rewind a little bit. So Casey was a vegan. And just to jump off for one second, he's, you know, in 2002, he was asked if he could reprise his role as Shaggy for a Burger King commercial. He agreed to do the commercial, but he said he would only do it if Shaggy was portrayed as a vegetarian. So since 2002, Shaggy has been a vegetarian, thanks to Casey. He was also a major animal rights activist. He was really big into supporting affordable housing and rights for the homeless. So in 1984, Jesse Jackson was a black candidate who was running for president. Casey gave him his support and even hosted fundraisers. He's an all-around progressive guy who was giving people of color his full support and wanted to help those less fortunate. This was long before the Black Lives Matter movement. Casey married a woman named Linda Myers in 1972. They were married for seven years and divorced in 1979. They had three children during this time. Their names are Mike, Julie, and Carrie Kasem. These three kids are in their 40s today, and I'm going to bring them up a bunch in a little bit. So one year after his divorce, Casey married a woman named Jean. This is 1980 now. Jean would continue to be married to Casey until his death in 2014. That's 34 years. Jean is another important character in the rest of the story. Jean and Casey have one child together, a daughter named Liberty. Remember I told you Casey was a proud American? He even named his daughter Liberty. Liberty was born in 1990. So to recap, Casey has three children from his previous marriage. Their names are Mike, Julie, and Carrie. His new wife is Jean, and they have one daughter together, Liberty. So he has a wife and four children. Let's talk about his wife, Jean, for a minute. So Jean was born in 1955. She's 23 years younger than Casey. Jean was an actress, but not like a super popular one. She played a recurring role on Cheers, and she did some cartoon voiceover work herself. Now, I have to tell you guys, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, and this is my own personal opinion, I try to keep my work unbiased, but I would feel like I was lying to you if I didn't tell you my opinion of Jean. Jean has a vibe that will drive you batshit crazy. She talks very soft, which is fine, but she makes her voice sound almost cartoonish. She's doing it on purpose, and to appear, she's doing this to make her voice appear more childlike and sweet. When you watch her, you get major Tiger King vibes. She is one of those people that lives for drama, and I can imagine she's difficult to be around. Now, Jean loved her daughter, Liberty, and seemed to be the perfect mom to her. She didn't have the same feelings towards Casey's three other children from his previous marriage, Carrie, Mike, and Julie. I'm not saying she's guilty of anything here. I'm just saying she's a real piece of work. Throughout this show, I'm going to refer to Casey's children a lot. I'm referring to Carrie, Mike, and Julie. Yes, Liberty is Casey's child too, but for the show's context and to keep it simple, when I say Casey's children, I'm referring to the three from his previous marriage. So in 1989, Casey bought his wife, Jean, a house for her 34th birthday where him, Casey, or excuse me, where Casey, Jean, and Liberty would all live together. Remember, he's 57 at this point. 
The house he bought her is right up the street from the Playboy Mansion. So this is their longtime marital home. They would end up living in this house from 1989 until 2013 when they put it up for sale for $43 million. This is where the major drama begins. So Carrie Kasem, who is Casey's daughter, is making a career for herself as a radio host, and she's doing pretty well with it. In 2013, she announced that her father had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease back in 2007. It just wasn't a real public thing. Well, the reason she announced this in 2013 is because his condition was getting worse. He was getting to the point where he was unable to speak. Well, you know that's what Casey is known for, his voice. When you take that away, the devastation he must have felt is extremely sad. His entire empire was built on his vocal cords. Everything he owned was because of his voice. He was also suffering from dementia. He obviously needed round-the-clock care. So after Carrie makes this announcement, Casey's wife, Jean, decides she doesn't want anyone to see her husband except her and their daughter, Liberty. Liberty is 23 at this time. Jean claims the other kids just use him for his money and she's cutting that stuff off right now. She forbids Casey's three adult children, Mike, Julie, and Carrie, from seeing their father. They would call and Jean wouldn't let them speak to their dad. In October of 2013, Carrie, Mike, and Julie protested in front of Casey and Jean's house, demanding to see their father. They hadn't seen him in three months. Some of Casey's longtime friends and his brother also joined in on this demonstration. They are out there with loudspeakers and signs and demanding to see their dad and their friend Casey. His daughter, Julie, is crying, saying she just wants her dad. I do not blame these people one bit. If some woman told me I couldn't see my dad, I would go off the rails, too. The police come, and Carrie explains that they want to see their dad, and their stepmom is making up things about them and telling people lies. So Carrie, with the help of her brother and sister, go to the courts and ask if they can have conservative, I'm going to say that wrong so many times, conservatorship over their father's care. You may have heard of this term conservatorship in the news recently with this whole free Britney thing. Britney Spears' father has conservatorship over Britney. I'll maybe do a podcast on that whole situation another day. What a conservatorship is, is when a person has a caretaker that is in control of their care. They control their finances. They are allowed to make any legal decisions for the person. It's kind of like being a parent of a minor. This is for a person who is incapable of making decisions for themselves. Some parents do this for their adult children who are drug addicts or have serious mental issues. A judge has to grant the person the conservatorship In Casey's case, his children see him as suffering from Parkinson's and dementia, and he has a net worth of $100 million. They also have this lunatic wife that they are dealing with, so they want to be in charge of everything and not Jean. I really can't blame them. So the court denied the children's request. They stated that he already had someone to make these decisions for him and that his wife, Jean, is the person who was going to be doing that. They may not like her, but she is still his wife. Jean states that during this time, her and her daughter Liberty were scared for their life and felt like they had targets on their backs. So Jean puts Casey into a nursing home so he can have round-the-clock care. She puts him in the nursing home under a fake name because she doesn't want his children finding out where he was and also because he's a celebrity and she wanted to keep his identity private from fans and the media. He's not in a complete vegetable state, but he's in a wheelchair, unable to talk, and suffering from dementia and Parkinson's, and he's in his 80s. In May of 2014, this is just a few months later, Jean checks Casey out of the nursing home at 2.30 a.m. She states she is trying to protect him from his children. By doing this, the doctors tell her it could be harmful because he is getting his nutrition through a feeding tube. She tells the doctor that she has an ambulance-type vehicle outside waiting for him and that he would be medically supervised. Instead, she puts him in a black SUV waiting outside She puts him in the back seat, and off they go. One week later, Carrie, Mike, and Julie go to the courts again and ask for conservatorship. 
They state their stepmom is nuts for taking their dad out of a nursing home where he's under the watch of nurses and doctors all day. So the court agrees that this was a real shitty move. So lo and behold, Carrie is granted what she has been asking for all this time, the conservatorship. And Carrie is kind of like the spos- you know, the, the spokesperson for the family. This is a game changer because now Carrie has more rights to their dad than his wife, Jean, does. He's basically Carrie's property at this point. And that was a really good decision, in my opinion, because I can tell Carrie truly loves her father and has concern for his well-being. So remember, Jean had taken Casey out of the nursing home in the middle of the night. Well, now Carrie has this legal document that says she is his guardian. So Carrie wants to know where her dad is so she can take over, but no one can find them. The court reaches out to Jean's lawyer, and the lawyer says he is no longer in the United States. Remember, this is an ailing man who is incapable of making decisions. He's also a celebrity. He is eventually found, but he was actually in the United States this whole time. Carrie hired a private investigator to follow Jean and Casey, mainly because she wanted to know her father's whereabouts. The private investigator said Jean put him on a plane and they went to a posh resort for a few days. Remember again, Casey is extremely frail at this point in his life. He can't talk. He can't walk. He has dementia and Parkinson's. He's on a bazillion medications. They got a charter flight and went to Las Vegas. Then they flew to Washington State, which is where and Jean and Casey stay. Casey's kids show up to their house and make a scene. They want their dad. They bring paramedics and an ambulance along with them. But the paramedics cannot get into the house because Jean won't let them. A few minutes later, Jean calls 911 and a second ambulance comes and takes Casey out of the house. After this, Jean comes outside and throws a pound of raw hamburger at Casey's daughter, Carrie. She yells out that she is following an order from the Bible. I throw this meat to you for the dogs. Here is what she says verbatim. In the name of King David, I throw a piece of raw meat in exchange for my husband to the wild, rabid dogs. She also stated they were treating her husband, an American treasure, like a piece of meat. Jean says the reason she needed to call 911 was because Casey was upset at the scene outside of his house. Jean held a news conference and plays a a cell phone audio recording of Casey moaning really loudly. Jean states he was moaning because he was upset his children were coming to take him away. The family's response to this audio clip of Casey moaning is that he was in pain due to having severe bed sores, a bladder infection, and a lung infection, and for Jean to say it was because he didn't want to go with his children is incorrect. On June 6, 2014, Casey was listed in critical condition in the hospital in Washington. He was stable, but he was critical. They were giving him antibiotics for bed sores, and that lets you know what kind of care he had been under with Gene. The doctor stated he had been in a bed for a long time and hadn't been moved or shifted. Now, I'm no nurse, but I'm pretty sure elderly bedridden patients are supposed to be moved and stretched and so on. He didn't receive any of that at home with Jean, so Casey's children go to see him, but a judge said they had to visit during separate times than his wife, Jean, which makes sense because these kids are ready to strangle this woman. The judge also said Casey had to be hydrated, well-fed through a tube, and medication given, and the judge wanted weekly updates on his condition. So Jean tells the judge that Casey isn't getting food or water under the care of his children in the hospital. So Carrie, through her lawyer, says she authorized the removal of the feeding tube due to a paper that her father had signed in 2007 stating he would not want to be kept alive if his condition was bad enough to never have normal functioning again. She's just following through her, you know, with her father's wishes. And just to jump off track for a moment, I'm not going to bash Carrie here that she had the feeding tube removed. It's no secret that my husband, Michael, refuses to take medications and has a strict DNR and end-of-life requests. He doesn't use any modern medication, not even Tylenol or cough drops. These are for his own personal reasons. He made it clear if he were in a life-or-death situation, he does not want any extra measures to keep him alive 
and it's and he certainly doesn't want any medication. I may not like it, but those are his wishes. And someday I'm going to have to explain this to a doctor, and it's going to be hard for me to do that. And some people will probably question what I'm saying, but that's what he wants. So again, I'm not going to bash Carrie, you know, for having her dad's feeding tube removed because she's following through with his wishes of no extra measures. It's important to mention what Jean has said about all of this so you guys can see both sides. Jean says that back in 2007, Casey's children took their disoriented father from his Bel Air mansion to a UPS store to sign an, a very important document. Jean says he was asked to sign his life away while he was on medications, he had sutures in his head and without his glasses on. I imagine the children did this in 2007 when he was first diagnosed with Parkinson's because they wanted this cleared up before his condition got worse. It was determined that the sutures he had in his head were from a small hair transplant. They weren't like, you know, brain surgery like Gene is making it out to be. The document Casey signed stated that his children, Mike, Julie, and Carrie, would be in charge of his future medical decisions, not Gene. Gene claims that this document is what laid the groundwork for his children to kill him. Those are her words. He, his children state he was of sound mind and he was terrified that Gene was going to find out he's off signing this paper. It's strange to think of this man who is extremely wealthy and a celebrity signing paper at a UPS store, but his children state he didn't want to go through a lawyer because he didn't want Gene to find out about what he was doing, so he had it notarized at the UPS store. So Carrie is complying with her dad's request from 2007 and requested the removal of the feeding tube because her dad is close to death. So the judge said that he understands and he reverses his order about keeping Casey hydrated and fed. Jean and their daughter Liberty are going ballistic, stating he needs to be kept alive and there's this big family feud. Casey Kasem died one week later on June 15th at the hospital. He was 82 years old. The cause of death was sepsis due to a bed sore. The bed sore on his back went all the way to the bone. He died surrounded by his three children, Carrie, Julie, and Mike. Carrie states that Jean and Liberty were allowed to be there, but they chose not to. Jean says her and Liberty were not allowed to be there, and they were too afraid to go to the hospital. She claims his children already killed him, and she was afraid her and Liberty would be next. Carrie's response is that Jean killed Casey, whether premeditated or by her careless actions. A legend who was dear to the hearts of so many people for over 50 years was gone. Now, Casey made it clear he wanted to be buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Los Angeles, California. This is where a lot of celebrities are buried, Betty Davis, Lucille Ball, Freddie Prinze, Nandy Gibb, and, and a whole bunch of others. So Carrie knows this, and she gets some kind of restraining order that would prevent Gene from cremating his body. Carrie also wants another autopsy done. Carrie takes the restraining order to the funeral home, and the funeral director tells her he's not here. Gene, his wife, had his body flown to Canada where it stayed on ice for weeks. She did this because his burial was being obstructed because his kids wanted him buried in Forest Lawn and she wants him somewhere else. Gene then has his body flown to Oslo, Norway. I swear this man isn't getting any peace even after his death. Carrie and her brother and sister are livid. Carrie states her dad is an American legend. He was as American as apple pie. She said he's never even been to fucking Norway and has no connection in Norway in any way, shape, or form. He's lived in Los Angeles for 58 years. Gene isn't even from Norway. I've seen photos of his grave in Norway, and it is this tiny little gravestone. It's not this big extravagant tombstone that he wanted in Forest Lawn in California. He's buried thousands of miles from home. It's literally this tiny little plot in the middle of a Norwegian cemetery. Only Jean and Liberty were present for the burial, but Jean brought a whole camera crew with her. Remember, Casey's estate is worth $100 million. So Casey's three children sue Jean for wrongful death against their father. They claim he suffered elder abuse and they suffered emotional distress from her not letting them see their father. They state that she killed their father. The, the suit states... 
Casey's early death occurred as a direct and proximate result of Jean's neglect and physical abuse. When Carrie's lawyer presented Jean with the wrongful death suit, she fainted on camera. The children eventually lost the civil case. Gene countersued them and claimed the children were motivated by their desire to get his money after he cut them off. She claimed they wanted to kill him. His children adamantly deny this. Carrie says there was no one in the world more evil than her stepmother, Jean. There was finally a settlement that took place just this past December. It's not public what the settlement details are. I imagine Jean was forced to give the kids some money, but I know his children were not happy with the outcome. They believe she is a murderer and has and have gotten has gotten away with killing their father. Carrie states she wants no money. She just wants this woman in jail. The mansion that Jean and Casey lived in is a mess today. Jean and Liberty are currently the only ones living there. The taxes aren't paid, there's a lot of overgrowth outside, and there is no electricity or running water. Liberty asked for help from her friends on Facebook because their situation was so bad. Well, the TV show Inside Edition came to the mansion with cameras, and it was just awful. In 2017, a a court-appointed trustee went to the mansion to try to get back some of Casey's memorabilia for his children. I don't know if this visit was successful or not. In 2018, the police concluded there was no evidence of a homicide and Casey's children did have the rights back then to make medical decisions on behalf of their father. Carrie Kasem went on to start a foundation called Kasem Cares, and it was created to raise awareness about elder abuse. It helped to pass legislation to protect the visitation rights of children. Currently, 12 states have the visitation bill, including California. Carrie wants to make sure no other children have to go through being denied to seeing their elderly mother or father due to their spouse. Carrie is also determined to bring her father's body back to the U.S. to be buried where he requested at Forest Lawn Memorial Park. Hopefully then he can rest in peace. This is a tragic story of a feuding family. It's a shame that Casey Kasem's legacy seems to be tarnished by all these events that occurred when he was bedridden and unable to speak. He was passed around at different states and facilities when he was in no condition to be traveling. He was a beloved American icon and made many children, teens, and adults happy playing their favorite hits and being the voice of Shaggy all those years. He has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I find it sad that he's resting halfway across the world, thousands of miles from anyone he knows, and in a country he didn't have any connection to. That's it for this week. Rest in peace, Casey Kasem. I'm going to sign off today using the same words he used at the end of his show each week. Keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars.